Hi, I'm Gigi Duban, and on this episode of Alabama Inc., we look at what it takes to turn a fun little hobby into a career. Pat Duggins gets a little flowery with Fred Spicer. He heads up the Birmingham Botanical Gardens. And Joe Calamusa is back to give Josh some tips on how not to lose hours of your life. Time management. It's coming up on Alabama Inc. all kinds of things for fun. Some knit, some build model trains, some dress their pets in weird costumes and post videos on YouTube. Well, for Tiffany Osborne, it was that Southern staple, Chow Chow. Take a look at how she's slowly turning a hobby into a paycheck. It's a Friday in Pinson, Alabama. And while a lot of people are watching the clock for the weekend, Tiffany Osborne is just getting to work. She sells homemade salsa and chow chow at farmer's markets all week. She brings the kids. It's rainy out, so she's not sure how big the crowds will be. But that's just part of the deal. I'm Tiffany Osborne, and um, my husband and I own uh, Tiffany's Gourmet Delectables. And we have a line of uh, salsas and chow chow and some jams and jellies. And where are we right now? We are at the Pinson Farmer's Market. I come here every Friday from 2 to 6 and set up this wonderful tent and uh, hope that people will, will try some of my product and take it home with them. Yeah, so it's just before start time. Oh, it's yeah, right, right about... Yeah, about two minutes before. They like to wait until 2 o'clock, you know, so we can stay right between, you know, the open and close hours um, of 2 to 6. So we haven't started just yet, so all the vendors are here. We're right. kind of trying to get set up. Tiffany's one of almost 15 million people in the okay. U.S. who are self-employed. <laughs> she's based at home, but she says if she's going to make it, she's got to cover a lot of ground. So she Thank sells her so goods much. all enjoy. over the Birmingham metro area. Oh, very good. Hope you enjoy that. <laughs> So woohoo! It's always exciting to make your first sale of the day. <laughs> oh, what did you? What, what was it? Uh, that was black bean and corn salsa. But all of it starts right here in her kitchen in Forestdale. When I was first getting started, it was, it's always, what if nobody likes my stuff? What if I've spent this money to make this stuff and nobody likes it? What if nobody comes to my table? And you know, and you get out there and if people don't know you at your very first market, they're not coming to your table. Um, and so you kind of, in, in, in the beginning, it, it's got a rejection factor. You're feeling like, oh gosh, nobody likes me and they don't like my stuff here. Why am I here? And then I'm gonna have to pay 20 bucks, you know, for the vendor fee because uh, I'm not selling anything. And so, you know, it's always that, yes, my first sale, I'm, I'm ready now, I'm on a roll. I'll oh, just okay. use this. There you go. There you go. All right. There we go. No, okay. You're not getting in here right now. Wow. That actually kind of works. It's different. It's going up heat. It's not super sweet with the blueberries. No. It's really nice. Kind of, like I said, it's kind of like my peach pineapple salsa. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this Very is... Very summer timing. Yes. I like it. Yeah, I won't offer it all the time. Um, this one's expensive to make. Is it? It's very expensive. What's the to most make. expensive thing in here? The blueberries. The blueberries. Blueberries are very expensive, um, which is another reason why I won't make it all the time. Mm. Some nights she's up long after the kids have gone to bed, okay. blanching Some tomatoes, off. chopping onions, yeah, slicing jalapenos. And, uh, At one time she just did it for fun, but when she lost her job, she needed an outlet. 
and the extra income. This all came from a hobby to a necessity. You know, when I lost my job, you know, I was thankful that I had already started this and had the wherewithal to be thinking in that direction. And so when I lost my job uh, and, and was, hadn't been successful in finding a job, this was really good to help supplement my family's income. And now um, that I've picked up more markets, it's, it's helping even more. Tiffany will be the first to tell you she's learned a lot working for herself. And she's made plenty of mistakes along the way. This is what I started out with. Uh, this was my mom's. This it's, was your mom's? This was my mom's. Wow. It was a real cheap, cheap pot. Yeah. And the first two times I burnt something that I worked all day on, oh. I said, that's it, mom. I love you, but can't, can't I can't it. keep burning my stuff. I put too much time in it. So then I invested in, in this pot. Someday, Tiffany wants to go big. Online orders shipped across the country, grocery stores, that sort of thing. So, I mean, obviously, ideally, um, I'd like for, you know, someone to pick up my product line and, and put it in their stores um, and resell it and, and buy it, you know, in bulk. And so, um, which would require, you know, a staff, a larger kitchen and, and so forth. Um, but, you know, just... Just for the sake of, you know, there are people who just like to go to farmer's markets. Um, and they count on me being there. And so I want to be there for them because I do, I, I do still enjoy, like I said, going there and meeting the people and setting up. For now, she's perfecting an old art and putting her own little spin on it. Coming up next on Alabama Inc. What we offer here at the gardens is reality. It changes every day. When I first moved to Alabama from Florida, they said when the Chilton County peaches are in season, you've got to eat the Chilton County peaches, right? Well, apparently up in New Jersey, they've got famous tomatoes, and Fred Spicer knows about both. He's the head of the Birmingham Botanical Garden, and here's how we got from here to there. Fred, uh, of all the places you could study uh, horticultural uh, engineering or whatever, why, why, why Rutgers? Well, landscape architecture, I grew up in New Jersey. And for me, uh, going to Rutgers, I had always thought about going to Rutgers, and it was a combination of really being far enough away from home, but not so far from home that I couldn't, you know, drive there in an hour and a half and do my laundry and raid the pantry and all those things that college students often rely on their parents for. Uh, so that worked out really, really well. And, um, you know, I didn't start out as a landscape architecture major. I started out as a fisheries biology major. Uh, so I very nearly worked with fish, but um, as I got into the meat and potatoes of, of what that course load looked like, I had the realization I wasn't going to be a scientist. Well, the math and uh, the hardcore chemistry, uh, but I found something in landscape architecture that combined um, a lot of elements of science and some engineering, as you said, with uh, kind of an environmental sensibility, a design sensibility, and uh, those were things that I felt that I had. Um, and, and, and that's where I ended up in, in a major of, the major of landscape architecture. So you know, your background, landscape architecture, and yet you're running a botanical garden. So I am. What wasn't on the pamphlet when you took the job that it's kind of like, this is what it's like, okay. Well, I had uh, moved uh, professionally, moved from doing landscape architecture design build I owned my own business. I ran several businesses for other individuals. So I gained a business background. And anytime you're dealing with, it doesn't matter if it's a for-profit business or a non-profit organization, you know, that's just a tax status. It's still a business. So that was a skill set I had acquired. And, and before moving here, I had had five years in public horticulture in northern New Jersey working for a large park commission. And during that work, I had uh, a lot of exposure to running a larger organization. We had two arboreta, de facto botanical gardens, and a number of other sites that I was involved in the management of. Project management, development, personnel management, 
plant collections development, those kinds of things. And so I feel it's been a really great match for these 14 years. Another uh, goal that you all work with are trying to, to cultivate, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, younger, uh, you know, horticulturists, you know, getting, sure. getting kids involved. In, sure. And in, in a day and age where you've got like videos and Twitter and da 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 how do you do that with a botanical garden? Well, the only way I think that you can counteract everything that's plugged in is with reality. You know, what your experience, what you experience on a YouTube video, except for your YouTube videos. <laughs> It's not reality, it's virtual. And if you look up the definition of virtual, what does it say? Not in fact. What we offer here at the gardens is reality. There are plants you can touch, you can experience it, it changes every day, and it's not changing the channel, it's the changing face of nature and living organisms. And so I think, I think it's something that we've lost um, in large part in America, I think there are a lot of children that grow up today who didn't experience, who don't experience what I experienced, which was, if you will, the hundred acre wood childhood. We went and played in the woods, you know, and we, and we interacted with dirt. You know, we didn't, there wasn't a screen, there wasn't something that ran on batteries or that we plugged into an electrical socket. It was real and it was, it was visceral and you could smell it and you could taste it and you could touch it and you could feel it. And we have kids that come through our programs um, who've never been in a, a woodland, who've never seen a forest. They're afraid of it. And that's not, that's not good. So I take it, this is kind of like the place I'm sure where the kids kind of like their eyes are like, you know, the biggest? They really pop. They really pop in here because they're seeing plants that are often things that they know. They know what a banana looks like, mm -hmm. but they don't know what the plant yeah. looks like that the banana comes from. Yeah, and the cacao. And the cacao, and they, to see that cacao fruit, or to see uh, a, a coffee flower. Uh, now, most kids are not consuming coffee, but uh, they understand <laughs> that concept, sure. and they understand uh, what the plant does. Or to see a papaya, yeah. and see the plant that all these things come from. And, you know, it's like going back, we, we see the end product very often, but we don't understand what the living organism that provides that product looks like or grows or what that plant requires to grow. So we can show them bananas and we can show them cinnamon and they can crush a leaf up and they can smell uh, what uh, cinnamon right off the tree smells like. Of course, we don't yeah. use the leaves, yeah. we use, use the, the bark. The yeah. bark, right, there exactly, you, grind, grind the bark. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it is a place that the kids really enjoy coming, especially in the winter because it's toasty. Where do you see the botanical garden 10 years from now? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, we, we try to look at that on a, on a regular basis. And um, my background is in planning. You know, so my response to that is, well, we try to plan for that. Um, we've put together a master plan. You know, the gardens is 50 years old this year. And it got here with the blood, sweat, and tears, and funding, and support from a lot of wonderful individuals and corporations and municipalities and foundations. And 50 years is a young garden. I mean, it really is. When you look at some of the venerable institutions in the United States and in, um, in, in parts of Europe that have been around for uh, more than 100 years and some more than 200. Um, so we want to plan for the garden's future. But uh, there are some things that we need to address. Um, people like me talk about sustainability, and that's kind of a buzzword. We're trying to do vis-a-vis -vis the master plan is to um, take a more sustainable approach, uh, work more closely with natural systems. One example is rainwater. You know, we get 54 inches of rain, plus or minus a year, on average, in Birmingham. We would like it to fall one inch per week, preferably at night, preferably gentle, <laughs> so it doesn't wash everything away. That never happens. So what we're planning to do in the future, so we don't have to rely on public water sources, um, which is not a good thing to do in a drought, um, is capture our rainwater. Um, we can use it to grow plants with, we can use it to grow plants around. There are so many plants, both native and non-native, that thrive in a moist streamside or lakeside or emergent 
environment that we don't grow because we don't have that environment. I want to grow those plants. I want to show the public what those plants look like and how they can be grown. I want to show engineers, landscape architects, the public, municipal managers, elected officials, what responsible stormwater management looks like. You can make it beautiful and you can make it sustainable and you can improve the lives of the people downstream from you and you can improve water quality. Uh, all the while, if we can gain some water to irrigate with during uh, some dry times, that'll save us money um, and that will help our living collection grow and develop. So we're looking into things like that as well as you know, some solar power. Um, I think there's a future in that for us on a small scale. It's got to be economically feasible, but uh, we think there's a future in that. And we're looking at ways that the gardens can continue to be many things to many people. That's one of the great things about working here. Coming up next on Alabama Inc. Plan um, and schedule out your time to meet those goals. I'm going to go Friday to buy those ridiculously tiny shorts. Each week on Alabama Inc., we bring in one of our show experts to talk with correspondent Josh Sneed. Our expert gives Josh a top five list, and Josh takes it from there. If you've ever checked Facebook in bed or procrastinated ever, this one's for you. Joe Calamuso from the University of Alabama's Business School comes back to talk time management. We all wish there was more time in the day, right? Well, we're wrong. Because there's plenty of time, it's just that spending four hours on Snapchat is a horrible waste of it. Luckily, Joe Calamusa from the University of Alabama Business School is here to teach us about time management. Because as we all know, timing is everything. All right, Joe, you're back. I'm wearing a purple shirt. Happy to be here. So, what do we got today? Well, it's five ways to manage your time better. Okay. People are always saying there's not enough time in the day, which is crap. That's right. Well, they say it because they don't really know how to organize and, and develop that time management plan. So they're lazy. <laughs> Largely, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so let's jump into it. Number five. Number five is have goals. Okay. Um, not everybody really understands where they're going, so no matter how organized they are and scheduled they are, they may not be moving any sort of any sort of purposeful direction because they don't have goals set for themselves. Okay, so start with small goals. Yeah, actually, what I would do is start with a, a, a larger vision for what you want to accomplish in an area, and then build smaller goals that'll help you get there. Okay. So it's like if you're going to run a marathon, 26 miles, 26.2 miles, but I've got weekly and monthly goals so that I'm reaching that 26.2 miles. Right, and you're getting the joy of like com accomplishing something. Yeah, as people like to check things off a list. So set small goals towards a big one and check them off the list as you go. But have goals first and foremost. All right, okay. Uh, number four. Number four is to make sure you schedule. So have a daily, weekly, monthly schedule so that you're planning out what you're doing to meet those goals. So, um, so if you're running the marathon again, so yeah, you, you, yeah. You know, schedule, I'm going to run at this time. I'm gonna exactly right. I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm not going to go run you know, seven days a week. You know, I need time off to, to rest. So I'm going to run four days a week. I'm going to run this route. I'm going to stretch it out this much um, at this time of day, whatever's best for my body. So plan um, and schedule out your time to meet those goals. I'm going to go Friday to buy those ridiculously tiny shorts. Yeah, absolutely. And, and spend way too much money on shoes that you really don't need. Those kinds of things. Those important yeah, things. Yeah, okay. a lot of shopping. Involved. All right, I like this. We're, we're making fun of yeah. marathon runners. <laughs> people are doing something with their lives yeah. we're like, you're crap. Well, they're smaller than us more than likely, so we'll be okay. Yeah, nobody's smaller than anyway. We'll move on. Um, number three. Uh, number three is to prioritize. Right. Um, especially because even when you've set your goals and you've set your schedule. If you have a lot of things on your schedule. Absolutely. And there are so many new variables coming in. People are coming to you with their problems and their issues. There are things that are happening all throughout the day. So you got to learn to say no and prioritize and understand I've got a goal to reach and I'm going to make sure I do the things today mm -hmm. to, to get closer to that goal and not get distracted. Right. So you, and as they come in, if you're good at it, you can kind of prioritize. Absolutely. And you, 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 the information comes in, you decide where it fits on your priority list and you put it on the list somewhere. It doesn't mean you're going to say no and then not do it. It just may not be an immediate thing. You don't necessarily have to tell that person, well, I'm bumping this to number four on my part. No, the, usually the, the less you tell them, the better. Um, right. But it, it, if, if they're going to get what they need in a timely manner, they, they don't care. And it's a matter of getting done what you need to get done to meet, reach your goals first and foremost. If you take care of yourself, usually you'll feel better about taking care of others later. Okay, that's good. 
All right, number two. Uh, number two is always to make sure that you don't get addicted to the urgent. And that kind of goes with number three, right? All these, pop, these things pop up, these fires and these urgent matters pop up. Well, we as human beings like to solve problems. We like to put fires out, especially if we're good at it. Like we, we, you know, we help people a lot. Yeah. And then we get addicted to it. So all that we do is chase the next problem, mm -hmm. chase the next fire, the next urgent matter, and we completely lose sight of our plan and our schedule and our right. goals. You're not necessarily helping yourself if you're constantly. That's right. You, know, you, you go home at the end of the day and you've done a lot. You've worked hard all day long. You you're ran. exhausted. You ran, but you didn't do anything. Or and to use the marathon example, literally you worked hard all day long handling issues and problems and people's problems and people's. You're um, ordering things. shorts for other people. Yeah, you're not ordering your <laughs> absolutely. Own shorts. But you actually didn't make your run. I mean, you didn't get your thing in. Um, because you're exhausted now. So don't get addicted to the urgent. Focus on what you need to do to reach your goals. Okay. That gets us to number one. We're already here. The number think? one thing to do in managing your time better is understand your limitations. Um, okay. People put together wildly um, uh, busy schedules that there just aren't feasible. I'm going to get all these things done today. No, you're not. So start with a half marathon. So, yeah, actually, you know what? Build up that way. Start with a half marathon. Start with a 5K if you're a beginner runner. Go to a half marathon, then a marathon. Understand your limitations. And then what goes with that Speaking is... Speaking of 5K, I was passed by a guy pushing a stroller in a 5K. Well... That's, that was my limitations. I, that, I know that. Your now. limitations are really, really low. I'm, I'm going to be honest. You should, you should and actually, I'm not a runner. I'm just trying to be honest with you, Joe, and you're uh, <laughs> the la the you're last part me. of number one is actually to push, my mom watches this show. To push, I'm, so, I, I'm sorry. Do you have any other children that would <laughs> could somehow overcome? Um, the, the the is to make sure that you know you do push those limitations, like the stroller. Right, right. I mean, understand them and, and work with them what you can work with, but you got to push yourself. People don't normally they understand what their limitations are, but they don't push past them. So you got to right. challenge yourself to move forward. Yeah, that's good. All right, Joe, thanks again for coming in. It's your second time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. All right, and I just want to point out that runners wear Band-Aids on their nipples. <laughs> and thank you. That's our show for this week. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Keep up with the stories we're working on and tell us what you think. I'm Gigi Duban, and we'll see you next time on Alabama Inc.